I've known John Brumman a long time. He's a really good guy. He graduated from Dow Seminary and from Tyndale Seminary, multiple degrees from Tyndale, and written uh, books and uh, speaks uh, widely. Pastors Free, I like the name of the church, Free Grace Bible Church. Yeah, don't you think that's a good name? And where are you, Saxy? No, we're out in Forney now. Forney, that's it, okay. And uh, a, a, a great church and good guy, and he and uh, Penny have been there a long time, and he's gonna be speaking on this important topic, and we need to bring the people out of the back up front. And you've got until you're starting a couple of minutes late, so it's 25, 35, 40. So you've got till what time? You get uh, 35, so you got till about seven after. Yeah, seven after. Seven after. All right. yep. Okay, let's go to Lord in prayer before we begin. Father, we thank you, Lord, for this time you've given us to take in your word. We pray, Father, that uh, help us to listen with attentiveness, Lord, and receive what you have for us. And we ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. As Bob said, eschatological is a fancy word simply meaning future. Future. Just think of future. We get the doctrine of systematic theology, the study of eschatology or end time events. So there are various judgments in scripture, but we're dealing primarily with future judgments from our perspective. Now, the timing of these judgments, I think there's two critical factors. When we look at all the various judgments, and I believe all the future judgments fall to these two, deal with these two categories. Judgment is associated with the timing of uh, the appearance of the judge. And so if we can figure out when the judge appears, then we can figure out when the judgment will occur. And for instance, I'm gonna argue that the uh, coming of Christ for the church, his appearance for the church in the rapture is the time for the Bema. Uh, second coming, his appearance will be the timing of the judgment of Israel, sheep and goat judgments, tribulation saints, and so forth. A second factor, I think, that would conclude the remaining judgments, including the great white throne judgment, would be judgment is associated with resurrection. So normally when you see a resurrection, you normally see a judgment associated with resurrection. So I believe those two categories will cover the future judgments that we're talking about. The appearance of the judge, and resurrection. Now, uh, here's a prophecy chart dealing with the judgments we'll be speaking of today. Uh, the first judgment, I believe, is the Bema, the judgment seat of Christ. This is for believers in the church age. I will argue that this occurs immediately after the rapture. After the rapture of the church, we will appear before the judge at the Bema seat judgment of Christ for an evaluation of the believer's works. Then we have the tribulation period will occur while we're in heaven. We have the second coming of Christ to the earth. And there'll be a series of judgments at that period of time. The judgment of living Gentiles, those who lived through the tribulation who are not certainly not part of the church. Uh, the church consists of believers who are saved from Pentecost till the rapture. So they, these are individuals who survived the tribulation period unbelievers and believers, there will be a judgment of living Gentiles, and I believe there's a concept of rewards uh, in that in Matthew 25. Uh, there'll be living Jews who'll be judged at that time. There'll be Old Testament saints, and that is through resurrection. So these individuals will be resurrected and will experience a judgment at that time, and then tribulation saints will be also judged. They will be resurrected, those who were martyred for their faith as in Revelation 20. And then uh, we have one future judgment, which is a judgment of all unsaved dead. There'll be a resurrection of unsaved individuals after the millennial kingdom and before the eternal state. And they will appear at the great white throne judgment in Revelation 20. So those are the future judgments we'll be dealing with. I wanna look at scriptural support for the timing of this judgment. This chart really shows that uh, various resurrections, and these resurrections are associated with the various judgments. There'll be those who'll be resurrected at the coming of Christ. Certainly there'll be those who are caught up alive. 
as in 1 Thessalonians 4, 17. We get the word rapture uh, from that Greek word harpazo, harpazo to snatch. And uh, church age saints will be resurrected and judged. Then we have the second coming of Christ. There will be a resurrection of Old Testament saints and tribulation saints. And then we have a future resurrection. The unsaved dead will be resurrected. Now, what about millennial saints? I think there's no scripture mention, mentioning the resurrection of millennial saints, but I presume that will be the case. If there'll be those who will die during the millennium or become believers. Some argue that um, those who survive the millennium uh, will not die, and uh, therefore, um, you know, I, I think I think uh, it's a possibility there'll be those who will not die. But anyway, the, there will be a resurrection of unsaved dead at that time. Now, the Bema, uh, James five nine. Let's take a look at that text, James chapter five, and we'll begin in verse seven. Uh, verse 7 speaks of the believer's uh, uh, response to the return of Christ for the church. We need to be patient for that return. Therefore, be patient, brethren. He's addressing believers. Until the coming of the Lord. This is a coming of Christ for the church. He gives the example of the farmer who waits for the produce. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, waiting patiently for it until it receives the early and latter rain. You also be patient, establish your heart, for the coming of the Lord is at hand. Uh, that phrase, at hand, I think speaks of imminence. The return of Christ could be at any moment. Uh, and therefore, we need to be expectant in light of that return. Now, in light of that return, we need to be careful how we treat one another as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. He says in verse 9, do not grumble against one another, brethren. Now, that never happens in churches, does it? <laughs> never. No, no. There's never ever a believer that complains about other believers in the church. And so James warns about this. He said, lest you be condemned. Behold, in the, in the exhortation here, in light of how our sanctification works out in relationship to fellow believers is... Behold, the judge is standing at the door. Now think about that. He ties us in with the return of Christ. And therefore, not only do we expect an imminent return of Christ, we have the imminent return of the judge. And I think that has implications of the timing of the Bema. When Christ returns, we have the judgment. It says, if the judge was standing out and behind the courtroom door, and then the judge walks through that door, all rise, honorable so-and-so presiding, and the trial begins. And so I think this is a picture and gives us a clue that shows us that when Christ returns, the Bema seat will convey immediately after the return of the judge. By the way, I believe the word standing there is in a perfect tense in the Greek. And this means that when James wrote this epistle, the judge was standing at the door. The return of Christ was imminent, and it is still imminent today. We had the perfect tense of past action with continuing results on into the present. So the eminency of Christ indicates that the judge could return at any moment. Now, let's take a look at Revelation chapter 4. Revelation chapter 4. And before we, while we're turning there to Revelation 4, we have several points uh, in light of this. The judgment will occur before the kingdom because rewards are associated with the coming kingdom. If we're promised that faithful Christians will rule reign with Christ, obviously we have to have the judgment before the kingdom. So that's one point in uh, 2 Timothy 2, 11 and 12. The rapture of the church is pre-tribulational. We can support that through many passages, including Revelation 3.10, 1 Thessalonians 5. We are not appointed unto wrath to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, 1 Thessalonians 5.9. And therefore, Christ will come before the tribulation wrath begins in Revelation chapter 6. The judgment will occur, as we saw in James 5, 9, immediately after the rapture of the church. The judge is standing at the door. And then we will argue from this passage that 
the judgment occurs before the tribulation period begins. So let's take a look at Revelation chapter 4, verse 4. And, and here we see the courtroom scene in heaven before God pours out, out his wrath and the sealed judgments upon an unbelieving world. As a matter of fact, uh, the view of the courtroom is there is wrath about to occur upon the earth, and there is one individual who is worthy to pour out that judgment. And they were searching heaven to see if there was any one individual, individual worthy to pour out that judgment, and that one is the Lamb. The Lamb is worthy to pour out that judgment. And around the throne there is angels, and also we have a group of individuals that are distinct, I think, from angels. There may be classes of angels in some of these other categories, but these 24 elders. Verse 4 says, Around the throne were 24 thrones, and on the throne I saw 24 elders sitting clothed in white robes, and they had crowns of gold on their heads. Now, what do we know about these elders? Well, I'm going to fast forward here. They are called elders. <laughs> and if you study that word in the New Testament, elders are leaders in the church. Elders is a term typically used of leaders or pastors, overseers in the church. In 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 7, and then 1 Peter 5, 4. Let's take a look at the 1 Peter 5 passage. The 1 Peter 5, 1 through 4. Here, uh, Peter says this, The elders who are among you, I exhort, I who also am a fellow elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, and also a partaker of the glory that will be revealed. Notice we have several uh, terms for the leaders of the church. They're called elders, they're called shepherds, and they're called overseers. Those terms, I think, here are synonymous for the leaders of the church. But... He gives an example here. He gives an exhortation to these elders to not be domineering in verse 3. He says, not being lords over those entrusted you. And that's a great entrustment to lead a group of individual believers. And it's a humbling thing as a pastor to realize that those who are under your teaching ministry are entrusted. They are given to you by the Lord Jesus Christ. And therefore, we have to be careful how we handle those who are entrusted to us. Many times we get frustrated as leaders. Uh, we want believers to grow in grace, and sometimes we want to buttonhole them or, or get angry in the pulpit and try to uh, make them do what they should do. <laughs> and sometimes you really can't do that. You have to be patient with the sheep. And therefore, we have to be careful not to be domineering. We are not to be domineering over those entrusted to us, but how do, you have, how do you get people to follow you? The biggest way is to be an example. He says, being an example to the flock, an example to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, realize that we are under shepherds. There's an over shepherd, the Lord Jesus Christ, to whom we are accountable. When that chief shepherd appears, you receive the crown of glory that does not fade away. What's interesting in this passage, he has two terms, elders, and he has the word crown. And both of those terms are used in Revelation 4 of these elders. They are elders, 24 in number, and they are crowned or rewarded. So I think this passage is key in the identification of who the 24 elders are in Revelation chapter 4. Now they're called elders in the church, and angels are never called elders. I can't find any passage in the Bible where angels are identified as elders. They are 24 in number. Now we go back to the Old Testament in 1 Chronicles 23. We won't look at that passage. But 24 elders, I believe, are a representative body. Just as the order of the Levites represented the entire nation. Therefore, if that was the case in the Old Testament of the 24,000 so Levites that represented the nation... Uh, the 24 elders, therefore, are representative of church-age believers. And I think these individuals personally are faithful pastors, faithful elders in the church. Literally, I take these individuals that are rewarded. They are rewarded, and therefore they represent the church that is rewarded. They are seated. 
Now, I don't want to push the analogy too far, but the seating here could be viewed as they are seated by virtue of their position in Christ. And the Bible describes believers as seated in the heavenly places in Christ in Ephesians, uh, the book of Ephesians, Ephesians 2, 6. The seating also indicates a completion of their work. As Jesus Christ was seated at the right hand of the Father after he completed his work in Hebrews chapter 10, verses 10 through 12. They're wearing white robes, white robes. And if we looked back just a few verses earlier in Revelation 3, 4, and 5, white robes are promised to faithful church age believers. Once again, the concept of reward here is mentioned in Revelation 3. Let's turn back to Revelation chapter 3, verse 4. Revelation 3, 4. You have a few names even in Sardis who have not defiled their garments, and they shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. He who overcomes shall be clothed in white garments. And I think this is referring to a faithful believer. I will not blot out his name from the book of life, but I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. As we call that an understatement. He will never, ever blot the, he blot the believers out of the book of life, but they'll be rewarded. They'll be honored publicly before the Lord Jesus Christ. So we have this concept of white garments as reward, just, or, you know, just the chapter before. Now, what, do, what else do we notice about these elders? They have crowns of gold on their head. Now, in the New Testament, we have two types of crowns. We have Stephanos crowns. Basically, those crowns are given for athletes who are victors. Uh, those are individuals who are rewarded. Paul speaks about running toward the prize, and we see 1 Corinthians 9, 24 through 27. Various crown, the crown given to us will not fade away. And then we have the diadem crown. We sing the hymn, bring forth the royal diadem. We see that type of crown worn by Christ in Revelation chapter 19, the kingly crown. But the crown mentioned here in Revelation 4 are Stephanos crowns. They are wearing Stephanos crowns of gold. In classical Greek, this is referring to those who were victorious, had victory in the local games. And therefore, it's in contrast to the kingly crown, the diadem crown. Crowns are promised in many passages. Here's just a sample of passages where believers are promised various crowns. Some have taken the five crowns, different types of rewards given to faithful believers. Uh, in Revelation 2.10, for instance, Revelation 3.11. So again, if we go just to the immediate context, we see that faithful believers are promised crowns. So I think it's no accident that these individuals are wearing crowns as well. I think you should tie this section into the prior section. 1 Corinthians 9.25, Paul speaks about a crown. There, 2 Timothy 4.8, James 1.12, those who endure trials will receive a crown. And then 1 Peter 5, 4, the faithful overseers will receive crowns as well. So crowns is a common concept for faithful church age believers. Walbert, Dr. Walbert says the crowns seem to indicate that the elders have been judged and rewarded. So if they're already crowned, that, that shows that the judgment has already occurred by this time. They are judged and therefore they are rewarded. Now let's go forward in chapter 5 verse 9, Revelation chapter 5. Revelation 5, 9, they sang a new song saying, you are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seal for you were slain and have redeemed us to God by your blood out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation. Now, there's a textual variant in this passage, and we're not going to deal with that. I think John Niemela dealt with the textual variant. We, we could spend a whole hour just on the textual variant. We're not going to talk about that. I'm reading the New King James, and uh, I'm going to accept it as written here. Uh, but I'm a majority text individual. But uh, the idea here is these individuals are redeemed. They are redeemed. This cannot be stated of angels. Angels are not redeemed. Christ did not die for angels. So these are human beings that are redeemed. 
by Christ's sacrifice, by his blood, out of every tribe, tongue, and people, and nation. So another thing about these uh, 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 24 elders is they are redeemed individuals. Now, the same identical Greek word for redeemed is used in 1 Corinthians 6.20, and these are individual believers who are paid their sins are they are bought by Christ, his sacrificial death. So the exact same Greek word is used of New Testament believers who are redeemed. Now, let's take a look at verse 10, Revelation 5, 10. And it made us kings and priests to our God, and we shall reign on the earth. The idea of the individual priesthood of believers is mentioned here. The idea of future ruling with Christ, we shall reign on the earth. That's a rewards concept. So let's take a look then at the points here. They're called kings and priests. The church is considered a priesthood of believers. We here in the Reformation, we know the priesthood of all believers. We can go directly to God and we have access to the throne of grace. Revelation 1.6, 1 Peter 2, 5 and 9. The church, those, these individuals will reign on the earth. Uh, and by the way, I think there's a passage in Hebrews 2 that indicates that angels are not given rulership positions of authority in the kingdom. And uh, maybe you can recall that passage, Bob, that's in, in Hebrews about angels yeah. not giving rulership position in the kingdom. So that's an interesting point further that I've thought of that uh, these individuals are, will reign with Christ in that coming kingdom. So these are believers. Millennial rewards is promised to faithful church age believers, 2 Timothy 2.12. Let's take a look at Revelation 3.21. Revelation 3.21. To him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne, as I overcame and sat down with my Father on his throne. So the overcoming is compared to Christ. Christ was faithful. He was obedient unto death, even death on the cross. And the faithful believer will have a future position of authority in Christ's coming kingdom. And so these individuals said, we will reign with Christ on the earth. We are rewarded because of our faithfulness. So again, I think this is referring to faithful church age believers, believers who are already rewarded at the Bema. Now, uh, John Niemela has an excellent article on this. Uh, I think he presented this at pre-trib, uh, and it's uh, titled Revelation 5, the 24 elders in the rapture. And this is his argument. If the 24 elders are human, then this passage is a formidable argument in favor of rapture preceding Daniel's 70th week. If they are human, the passage narrows down the timing of the Bema seat, which necessarily follows the rapture. Rapture, Revelation 4, John was caught up to heaven in this vision. And then we have the Bema occurring afterwards. After 4-1, but before the 24 are called elders, uh, the, these individuals or while the 24 are called elders, these individuals are in heaven at, and rewarded. They sing about the declaration at the Bema that the elders will rule as kings. And then Christ opens the first seal. And so while these individuals are praising Christ, um, there, there is one individual who is about to pour out his wrath upon an unbelieving world. So we know the timing there is before the tribulation because the sealed judgments are not yet poured out. And we know that the chronology after chapter 4 and 5 of Revelation, the next major event is the pouring out of the sealed judgments. And the pouring out of the sealed judgments begins the tribulation period. And therefore, this has to occur after the rapture and before the pouring out of the sealed judgments. So the chronology has an interesting effect that has not been noticed. The Bema seat would occur before the rapture and the opening of the first seal. That is, it would occur during the interval between the rapture and the start of Daniel's 70th week. Now let's take a look at another passage, Revelation chapter 19, verses 7 through 9. And in this section, the tribulation period uh, is near an end, 
and we're, the individuals are awaiting the return of Christ in his second coming, his return to the earth. So here's we, here we have a scene in heaven that reflects about events ready to happen. Let us be glad and rejoice to give glo him glory for the marriage of the Lamb has come. Notice has already occurred. I believe we have an error since there. It has already occurred. So the marriage has occurred and the wife has already made herself ready. So the preparation of the bride for the marriage, that has already occurred. Now it's further described in verses eight and nine. To her it was granted to be arrayed in fine linen, clean and bright, for the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. These are faithful deeds. And therefore, that certainly pictures the Bema seat occurring before the second coming. So these individuals, a bridegroom groom is dressed in white, and white, being dressed in white, is associated with reward. Therefore, these are believers who are rewarded. Then they are married, and then they await the marriage supper, which will occur on the earth. And those are the events given here. So we had the preparation of the bride, then once the bride is prepared, she is married, and the church is, I think, the bride of Christ. We're married to the Lord Jesus Christ. And then we have this wedding supper, which will occur on the earth. So he says here very clearly, verse 8, To her it was granted to be arrayed in fine linen, clean and bright, for the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. This is not imputed righteousness by faith in Christ. This is referring to the deeds done that are rewarded. Verse 9, Then he said to me, Write, Blessed are those who are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And therefore, that supper is still future. I think it will occur on the earth as the bride returns to the earth. These are true sayings of God. So, several key points. The bride prepares before the wedding. The bride prepares before the wedding, verse 7. The wife of Christ is his church, all believers from the day of Pentecost to the rapture. The fine linen is the righteous deeds of the saints. This picture is the saints rewarded at the judgment seat of Christ. And conclusion, the judgment seat of Christ takes place in heaven, in heaven, before the second coming. Now, in the Grace New Testament commentary, I think Bob Vicentac wrote this section on Revelation. Here's what he said about the word called. Uh, Blessed are those who called to the marriage supper. The word called here means invited. The Greek word or, or one of its cognates is used frequently in the New Testament in reference to an invitation to share in the rewards and glory of God's kingdom. So the bride is ready. The bride is ready to rule with Christ and share in those rewards. So we have a rewards concept in this section here. So again, I think that points to the Bema occurring before, in heaven, before the bride returns to the earth. Now, let's deal with the judgment Old Testament saints. Uh, let's take a look at Daniel chapter 12. Daniel chapter 12. At that time, Michael shall stand up, the great prince who stands watch over the sons of your people. And there shall be a time of trouble such as never since there was a nation, even to that time. At that time, your people shall be delivered, everyone who is found written in the book. And Daniel here describes an unparalleled time of trouble for Daniel's people, the Jews. And by the way, there are several times in the, in the Old and New Testament that describes this period as unique in world history. How many unparalleled times in world history can there be? One, if it's unparalleled, <laughs> right? There can only be one, right? There's no other unparalleled time that's unparalleled. So the idea is this is going to be the worst time in the history of the world. Jesus describes that in Matthew 24. He uses the book of Daniel to describe this future. I call this the great tribulation, the last three and a half years of Daniel's 70th seven. And he knows at that time, so that shows that this is the tribulation period, the great tribulation. And at that time, your people shall be delivered. Now who's Daniel's people? Who are they? 
The Jews. Church is not in existence. Keep in mind, the church is a mystery. So we're talking about the Jews that will be delivered. Now, uh, what does that word delivered mean? I think it refers to national deliverance. Uh, Paul in Romans 11 speaks of all Israel being saved. And therefore, there will be a national deliverance of Israel at the second coming of Christ. Everyone found written in the book. And I think those are Jews who are, will be delivered at that period of time. So this first one tells us a timing. It's the Great Tribulation period. There will be a national deliverance of Israel, I think equating Romans 11.25. And then let's take a look at verse 2 of Daniel 12. And many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake. So we have a resurrection. We have a resurrection. Now, this is not a resurrection of church-age believers. That occurred seven years prior. This is a resurrection of Old Testament saints, including the one who's writing here, Daniel. There will be a resurrection. Those who are asleep in the dust of the earth shall awake. Some to everlasting life. And then others to shame and everlasting contempt. This doesn't mean that the resurrection of unsaved dead occurred at this time. I think there's a distinction here. He's referring to two classes of resurrection. And I think this is exactly what is going on in John 5. We have two classes of resurrection, not simply the, uh, those who are resurrected, a universal resurrection and judgment occurring. So verse 2 indicates a resurrection will occur. I think this is the resurrection of Old Testament saints. And keep in mind our first two principles that we started out with. Resurrection and this, the appearance of the judge are two indicators to tell us the timing of various judgments. So we have resurrection of Old Testament saints. Resurrection of the unsaved dead will occur after the millennium. We have the New Testament evidence in Revelation 20, 11 through 15. So he's saying that these are the, the unsaved dead will be resurrected later. New American Standard says this, Many of those who sleep in the dust of the ground will awake, those to everlasting life, but the others separating this resurrection to disgrace and everlasting contempt. So he's, he's distinguishing the classes of resurrection. By the way, Merrill Unger's commentary in the Old Testament, he does an excellent job in expounding further on this point. Let's take a look at verse 3 of Daniel 12. Those who are wise shall shine, those who are wise shall shine like the brightness of the firmament, and those who turn many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. I think we have a rewards concept here. So if this is a rewards concept, who does this apply to? This applies to Old Testament saints. Old Testament saints who are faithful will be rewarded. They will be rewarded. So I think this speaks of the judgment that will occur. So this pictures the rewards of the resurrected Old Testament and tribulational saints. Now, Unger says this, It is to be expected that the resurrection of the righteous will be followed by their being rewarded for their fidelity to the Lord as believers. It is noteworthy that no allusion is made to the punishment of the wicked and the apostate referred to in, in 2b. The reason is simple. And he says, see comments on verse 2. Their resurrection will not take place until after the millennium at the great white throne judgment. And I think that's an excellent point. So we do have a reward here associated with resurrection. So that does speak of a judgment occurring at this point. Now let's take a look at the end of the chapter. In chapter 12, verses 11 through 13. Chapter 12, verses 11 through 13. And from the time that the daily sacrifice is taken away and the abomination of desolation is set up, there shall be 1,290 days. Blessed he who waits and comes to the 1,335 days. But you go your way till the end, for you shall rest and will arise to your inheritance at the end of the days. Here we have a, a, an additional period of time that goes beyond the end of the tribulation and into the beginning of the millennial kingdom. Simply put, and I have a chart here uh, by Tommy Ice, there's a 75-day period beyond the end of the tribulation. If you count the 1,260 days from the midpoint 
uh, you have an additional 30 days, and then in, in Daniel 12, 11, an additional 45 days in 12, 12. Now, what's going on in that period of time? Well, I think we have various judgments occurring. Judgment of sheep and goat nations, judgment of Israel. I think you have uh, assignments of positions of authority in the kingdom. Christ is preparing his administration during that period of time. But Daniel mentions that preparation time for that coming kingdom. So this is a period, I think, where we have several judgments going on before the, uh, the establishment of the kingdom. But in particular, we're dealing with Old Testament saints. Now, I want to point out, uh, let's go back here. So we have here the resurrection of Old Testament saints we saw earlier in the chapter. This will occur sometime during the 75-day interval between the end of the tribulation period and the beginning of the kingdom. I think the resurrection of the Old Testament saints occur within that time frame. The reason being is because he says, you will arise to your inheritance. The very last verse of Daniel 11. The arising to your inheritance is a resurrection. So Daniel will be resurrected to receive his reward, his inheritance at the end of that period of time. So arise speaks of Daniel's resurrection. Inheritance, what does that speak of? Well, we think of the Old Testament concept of inheritance. And I think the Old Testament concept of inheritance in that identical Hebrew word is used in Numbers 33, 54 of inheriting the land. And keep in mind, as a Jew, Daniel would inherit that land, the land of Israel. He would have a share in that rulership with Christ. Now, I don't know if you've seen the uh, chart by Arnold Frutenbaum that he has the administration of the kingdom. He has a Jewish branch and a Gentile branch. Church, the church will rule in the kingdom, I think, in various nations, but the Jews in particular will inherit the Abrahamic covenant blessings. So the Abrahamic covenant blessings will include portions of land in the land of Israel as a rewards concept. So we need to think about rewards for Old Testament saints, especially Jewish Old Testament saints at that time. So Daniel's inheriting the Jewish millennial land promise in the Abrahamic covenant. And I think that's what it means by you will rise in that resurrection to receive your reward at that period of time. So again, this presupposes a judgment of Old Testament saints at the end of the tribulation before the kingdom. Now still with the judgment of the sheep and goats. In uh, Matthew 25, 31, let's take a look at that passage. Matthew 25, verse 31. When the Son of Man comes in His glory and haul the old, all the holy angels with Him, then He will sit on the throne of His glory. Now, if we go back to the chronology in Matthew 24, verse 31, we have, he's really what he's doing is picking up where he left off in Matthew 24, 31. He speaks about the second coming. Uh, they will see the sign of the Son of Man appear in heaven. They will see all the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. What coming is this? Well, he mentions the coming after the tribulation. Verse 29. So we have the chronology there. We have the end of the tribulation. We have the second coming of Christ, which is not the rapture here. It's the coming of Christ to establish his kingdom on the earth. So Matthew 25, verse 31, speaks of the coming with his angels to administer rule on the earth in his kingdom, the throne of his glory. Remember Revelation 3, 21, he says, the one who overcomes he will sit with me on my throne as I overcame as now on God's throne at the right hand of the Father, two separate thrones. And then the various ethnos, Gentile nations will be gathered together. There's no mention of a resurrection here. Read down. These are living individuals. These are living individuals, uh, Gentiles who survived the tribulation. But an important point in verse 34 is the king will say to those on his right hand, Come, you blessed. I think there's a concept of reward there, blessedness. Matthew 5, blessed are you. I think reward. Uh, inherit the kingdom. 
prepare for you from the foundation of the world. These are individuals, and they're rewarded based on how they treated the Jews during the tribulation period. So they were faithful, therefore rewards concept here in Matthew 25. So the important point is this occurs after the tribulation and before the coming of Christ to establish his kingdom, the timing. Now let's deal with the judgment of living Jews in Luke 19. Luke 19, verse 11. And uh, I may not have time to read this whole section here, but we have the parable of the ten minas. Uh, we know that there's a certain nobleman that leaves to go to receive a kingdom. One day he will return, and, this, and these individuals will give an account of how they administered their affairs. There will be those who would rule over various cities. I think the concept of rulership in the kingdom is pictured here. Uh, those who are faithful, verse 17, for instance, he said to him, Well done, good servant, because you are faithful in a very little, have authority over ten cities. So again, the rewards concept in the coming kingdom. Now, what I want to point out is, I think sometimes we look at that as the Bema, but there, I think there's a problem if we do so. I think this is referring to Jews who are rewarded. As we saw in Daniel chapter 12, there'll be Old Testament saints who'll be rewarded, but I think these are Jews who are alive. So I, I want to make four points here in the parable of the Minas. Here's my point. The individuals here are not resurrected. No picture of resurrection, whereas in the rapture of the church will be some caught alive, certainly, but there will be a resurrection at the Bema. So these individuals here are not pictured as being resurrected. Second point, the location's not heaven. Locations on the earth. They're waiting for the second coming of Christ. Third point is, I think the coming here is the second coming to establish his kingdom. Second coming to establish his kingdom. And fourthly, I, my point is, faithful Jews will be rewarded with positions of authority in the kingdom. And I want to say this, I think we need to maybe look at some of the passages that we have typically identified as Bema Seat reward. And I think the confusion of the timing of the Bema Seat comes because we have allocated certain judgments in the Gospels to the church. And they said, well, then the Bema can't be till the second coming when it comes to the earth. Whereas if we put it in the classification of these are not church age believers, but these are living Gentiles, then the confusion is clarified. So I think we need to look at that and realize that certainly application can be made to uh, church age believers because if God rewards faithfulness in the Old Testament, it rewards faithfulness in the tribulation, certainly he will reward faithfulness in the church age as well. So we're not taking away from the constant rewards, we're just clarifying the timing here. And here's a chart here, the various rewards. I think there's another judgment of angels that will occur right before the great white throne judgment, but we're not dealing with that this morning. Now, a couple more judgments, and I think I'm about out of time. Let's take a look at Revelation 20, verse 4. We'll quickly deal with this. Revelation 20, verse 4. And I saw thrones that they that sat on them, and judgment was committed to them. Then I saw the souls of those who have been beheaded for their witness to Jesus, and for the word of God, who have not worshipped the beast or his image, had not received his mark on their foreheads and on their hands, and they lived and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. They lived resurrection, they reign reward. So these are individuals who were beheaded. Obviously, he's referring back to the tribulation period under the Antichrist. These are martyrs for the faith. These are believers. And because of their faithfulness unto death, he, he rewards them with positions of authority in the coming kingdom. And therefore, the timing is uh, certainly right before the coming kingdom. And therefore, they're rewarded at the end of the tribulation before the coming kingdom. And then finally, the judgment of angels. We won't deal with that. Revelation 20, I think, occurring right after the end of the tribulation. Uh, right to the end of the kingdom and before the eternal state. And um, just want to say the great white throne judgment, we have a resurrection before the destruction of the heavens and the earth. And the unsaved dead, I think, will stand in space. And this is Pentecost's argument. Where is the location of the great white throne judgment? Heaven and earth is gone. And they'll stand face to face in space before the judge. And I think they will see 
All the things they've invested in this earth burn before their eyes. They're resurrected before God destroys the heavens and the earth. They stand before the divine judge in, in space. And this will occur before the eternal state. So clearly the timing there is right before the eternal state. Again, the appearance of the judge. And uh, just want to end with, for you as a born again believer, realizing that your sins have been paid for as far as the propitiation, his work of Christ, of, of work of Christ on the cross, 1 uh, John 2.2. 2. Jesus Christ uh, died for you, and therefore the issue of your judgment is the issue of reward. And we'll close at John 5, 24. Verily, ver most assuredly I say to you, he who hears my word and believes in him who sent me has everlasting life, and like this phrase shall not come into judgment, Amen. but has passed from death and life. You will not face a judgment that condemns you to an eternity in the lake of fire because of your faith in Christ. All right.